sound better testing one two how's that sound for you We're good? No. One, two, three, four. Hey, man, I love it. One, two, three, four. Ever I'll share. Oh, we're good? Okay. Wow. One, two. Do you want to go slower? Uh, yeah. no. okay. Is that okay? Uh, okay. Wow. <laughs> So do you want to do the whole thing? Or just yeah, one time we'll out there on Wednesday night. Uh, me and Mrs. Carson have a scoop off. Like she'll keep playing, I'll come up, I'll stop, and then she'll keep playing or whatever. You don't want to mess up? So one time, You're going to do fine. Yeah, no, it's okay. And I was like, it's Jesus good. saves, so, Jesus saves. You do. So she can hear me through like microphone or in her okay. monitor. We just need to do something. Okay. Through the live up on the timing um whenever we got back to like the regular chorus i got messed up on the timing but besides that i think that's fine all right do you want to do it one more time or do you think it's good uh can we do one more time? where's mrs car she is just so long she's not like trying to yeah no i don't see her i think it's fine all right okay the second verse though yeah. do you want to do the second verse or the whole thing? we can start from the second well, verse yeah let's just do the Thank you. 
Let's see back at Mesa Baptist Church tonight. Appreciate you making it for evening service. We're going to have a good time in God's house this evening, and we're glad you're here to be part of everything that's going on tonight. Let's all stand if we can. We're going to begin our service with number 362, Rescue the Perishing. That's our job. That's our duty, number 362, as we sing nice and loud. 362, Rescue the Perishing, Care for the Dying. Snatch them in pity from sin and the grave. We for the erring one lift up the fallen. Tell them of Jesus the mighty to save. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. Though they are sliding him, still he is waiting, waiting the penitent child to receive. Plead with them earnestly, plead with them gently, he will forgive if they only believe. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. Rescue the perishing, duty demands it. Strength for thy labor the Lord will provide. Back to the narrow way, patiently win them. Tell the poor wanderer a Savior has died. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus is merciful. Jesus will save. Amen. Great singing on a Sunday night, too. And some smiles this evening. Yeah. Praise the Lord for that. Number 521. Number 521. I haven't sung this song in a long time. Number 521 will work till Jesus comes. Listen to this first verse two times, Brother Ian. Number 521. O oh, land of rest, for thee I sigh, when will the moment come? When I shall lay my armor by, and dwell at peace at home. We'll work till Jesus comes, we'll work till Jesus comes, we'll work till Jesus comes and we'll be gathered home. I remember that song. Raise your hand. It's been a while. How many of you are still kind of learning it? All right, a few more. All right. Ian, can we go back to that first verse? What? Never? never? Who's never heard of it? All right. Really? That's surprising. All right. If you want to get your songbooks out, it's number 521. You can follow the notes. Unless you're like, wait, then just move your mouth. All right. All right, number 521, sing it out nice and loud. If you know it, encourage those around you. If you don't know it, you're going to learn it tonight. All right, here we go on this first verse again. 
O land of rest, for thee I sigh, when will the moment come? When I shall lay my armor by and dwell in peace at home. We'll work till Jesus comes, we'll work till Jesus comes, we'll work till Jesus comes and we'll be gathered home. Not bad. On the second. To Jesus Christ I fled for rest. He bade me cease to roam and lean for on his chest till he conducts me home. We'll work till Jesus comes. We'll work Till Jesus comes, we'll work. Till Jesus comes and we'll be gathered. Let's have the instruments play through a few times. We'll be our guests and visitors this evening. to our seats tonight. We're singing number 521. We'll work till Jesus comes. All in this third verse, and you find your place, join us on that chorus. I saw that once my Savior sighed, no more my steps shall roam. With him I'll brave death's chilling tide and reach my heavenly home. We'll work Till Jesus comes, we'll work. Till Jesus comes, we'll work. Till Jesus comes and we'll be gathered home. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Kenny. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. I'm glad you're back. How many of you are saved tonight? Know it for sure. Are you glad about it? Are you ashamed of it? No. So... Uh, Won't well, we take a few minutes tonight and we'll just go around the auditorium and tell us when and where you got saved at, okay? Who'd like to be first tonight? Brother Charles. Here in your office, January 29th, 2001. Amen. January 29th, 2001. I remember that. Miss Hope. July the 4th, 1971, Bloomfield, New Mexico. Bloomfield, New Mexico. Amen. All right. Uh, yes, sir. February 11th of 1978 at 7 p.m. in the evening in my room, I was jumping for joy. Amen. Realizing, realizing that I was saved and I just couldn't contain myself. Amen. Great testimony. Thank you. Who else? 
Syracuse, New York. Miss Helen. Uh, August 13th, uh, 2020, um, at my house and with you. Amen. You and Brother Greg, same time. That was a great time. Okay. How about over here, Miss Valerie? October 10th, 2001. Wow. In your kitchen. In my kitchen. Dining room table. I remember that. All right. Way back in the back, Miss Bobby. All right. Alessandra. Speak up real loud so this deaf preacher can hear you. Here at church. Do you remember the date? September 2018. Amen. All right. Who else? Miss Harvetta? August 1982, 74. Amen. Tish? J. Vernon McGee, 1978. 1978. Amen. J. Vernon McGee led you to the Lord personally. That is awesome. Okay. All right. Yes, sir. Brother Folks. Uh, 1977, Fairfield, California, Calvary Baptist Church. Amen. Who else tonight? Juan? December 1989 in the kitchen, Santa Fe. All right, in Santa Fe. Miss Sandy? May 1978 in Austin, Texas. Amen. Way back in the back. Miss Alice? January 19th, 1990 at my house, and Jeannie Yarber led me to the Lord. I on the phone. Jeannie Yarber led you to the Lord. That's amazing. Okay. Yes, Gloria. October 2016, Gospel Light. Amen. Yes, Miss Wolfbrandt. February 1963, Golden Raton, Florida. 1963. You got saved before me. I was waiting to see if somebody's been saved longer than me. Yes, sir. April 2011, I'm sorry. Amen. Anybody else? Way back in the back. Yes, ma'am. Miss Ann. <laughs> Yeah. And, Mrs. and you were sitting back there in that corner. I remember you had a red dress on. Looked like Flash Gordon come down the aisle. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Amen. All right. Got time for one or two more. Yes, ma'am. Diana. Santa Fe, New Mexico. Mrs. Jo Miss Jody. 1962, Abilene, Texas, Trinity Baptist Church. 1962. She was only one year old at the time, okay? <laughs> no, she was, uh, yeah, you were. How old were you? Nine. You were nine, okay? Nine years old. That's what I thought. I couldn't do the math in my head. One more. Yes, sir. Brother Tim. August 77, Chattanooga, Tennessee. Amen. Amen. Well, aren't you glad you're saved? Amen. What would you ch take in exchange for your salvation? Nothing. Well, if somebody offered you a billion dollars, would no. you take it? No. Not on your life. It is the greatest thing we can ever have. Well, we have a lot to be thankful for, don't we? God's been so good to us. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, as we come to your throne tonight, Lord, it's really great to hear these testimonies of, of your salvation, Father. We call it our salvation, but it's your salvation. You gave it to us. And um, Father, I pray if there's any here tonight, Lord, that uh, they couldn't give a similar testimony uh, of, uh, of knowing when and where it was when they turned from their sin and put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Uh, Lord, that tonight they would trust him and call upon him to be their Lord and Savior. And uh, Father, I pray for your help as I preach your word tonight, Lord, and all of us here, Lord, who are saved, we want and need your blessings in our life. And yet, Lord, sometimes if we're not careful, we can kind of drift away. It's not deliberate, but it still has the same bad consequence. And uh, Lord, I pray that you'd speak to our hearts, Lord, and speak to the hearts of those who are uh, watching online tonight through the live streaming of the service. And God, we ask that you would bless this offering. And again, Father, we thank you for this wonderful gift of salvation. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you as you give tonight. You may be seated.
Hey, Amen. Thank you, Nick and Laura. That was great. Uh, before we stand for our last 10, let's recognize some birthdays and anniversaries. Is anybody having a birthday this week? Anybody having a birthday this week that we can recognize? Any birthdays? No birthdays this week. How about anniversaries? Any anniversaries this week? No anniversaries. No? Nobody. All right. We got one next Sunday, but not this week, huh? All right. All right, you bunch of liars. All right. <laughs> Maybe we'll in song. If you have some dollar just hold it up and he'll run around as fast as he can and he'll you and he'll bring it up for you, okay? And so you can give it to a child or those a child in heart, all right? And so number 625, Faith is the Victory. This is our change offering song as we sing this first verse together. Encamped along the hills of light, ye Christian soldiers rise and press the battle ere the night shall veil the glowing skies. Against the foe in veils below, let all our strength be hurled. Faith is the victory we know that overcomes the world. Faith is the victory, faith is the victory, oh glorious victory that overcomes the world. His banner over us is love, our sword, the word of God. We tread the road, the saints above, with shouts of triumph tribe. By faith they like a whirlwind's breath swept over every field. The faith by which they conquered death is still our shining shield. Faith is slowing down. Victory, faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. To him who overcomes the foe, white raiment shall be given. Before the angel he shall know his name confessed in heaven. Then onward from the hills of light, our hearts with love aflame will vanquish all the hosts of night in Jesus' country name. Faith is the victory, faith is the victory, oh glorious victory that overcomes the world. Let's give way to big hand. Yeah. Probably double our offering. You may be seated tonight. So if we have any qualified people in the house, uh, do you remember that show years ago? It used to be on TV, that game show called uh, The Gong Show. Remember that? And uh, remember if you got gonged and they had that guy that ran around? That's, that's who it reminds me of. Amen. What did they call that guy? Anybody remember? Chuck Barris. Yeah, and yeah, Chuck Barris was a guy that did the show, but uh, that guy that came out and ran around after they hit the gong, uh, that's, that, that's, that reminded me of Wade. And, um, pardon me? Yeah, Mean Gene, the minute. Gene, 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 the dancing machine. Wade, Wade, the, uh, yeah, whatever, okay? So we, we got a guest here tonight, Brother Mac. He's a missionary, and uh, he's visiting our church today. He lives here in the area. So we're not crazy, okay? We just like to have a good time at church, okay? And the Bible does say that God loves what type of giver? Cheerful, Cheerful giver. So if that doesn't put a smile on your face, your smile's broke, all right? Get your Bibles tonight. Find the book of Haggai, Haggai chapter 1. And uh, we'll, we'll read that text in just a minute. And uh, sure glad you're here tonight. Appreciate those who are watching online. And, uh, you know, I really preached hard this morning about being faithful to church. And I'm glad that you're faithful. And uh, what I have figured out is that unfaithful people, they're hard to move sometimes. And, uh, you know, you can leave sometimes the preacher and say, well, that message didn't make any difference. But that's not true. Every time we preach God's word, it makes a difference. Amen. Amen. And, uh, you know, if nothing else, it testifies for us if we obey it. And if we don't obey it, then it's a witness against us when we stand before the Lord. And so uh, God's word never returns void. God always uses it and blesses it. And uh, tonight we're going to see a case where uh, a preacher got after the people of Israel. And uh, typically when that happened, did the people of Israel listen or did they just ignore him and keep on go doing what they were doing? Typically they did what? They just ignored him. They just ignored him. 
And uh, but here tonight, we're going to see that the people listen to the preacher. And uh, it's a very powerful message, I hope and pray. And uh, we're here in the book of Haggai. Haggai was a post-exilic prophet. That means after they came out of Israel, God used him to preach to the Jewish people. And uh, Haggai is the second shortest book in the Bible, uh, but is a very powerful book because the message is that if we want God's blessings, we have to put God first in our life. Would you agree with that tonight? Now, not, not all Christians really believe that because they still expect God's blessings, but they want to do life their way and not God's way. And it never works that way. God will never bless that. And uh, this book is written to people like us. Uh, tonight, uh, I think we all agree that God should be first in our life. Would you agree with that? Amen. Yeah, we all agree with that. God should be first in our life. But do we always practice it? No, we don't always practice it. And, uh, you know, these people here, uh, these Jewish people, they would have said, amen, God needs to be number one in your life. He needs to be first. But they weren't practicing it. And uh, what they professed to believe was not influencing the way that they lived their life day by day. And uh, they were guilty, like so many of us, of giving lip service to the priority of God in their life. But the reality was they had other priorities ahead of God and most typically, usually their self. And so God sent his prophet Haggai to help them get their priorities back in line with what they profess to believe. Aren't you glad that when we get away from God, God will usually always raise up somebody to speak to us, to try to, try to get us back uh, uh, in the right place with the Lord? Aren't you glad God always does that for us? God is such a gracious God. And so he raised up this prophet uh, to preach to them. Now, the historical setting here, I said he's uh, one of the post-exilic prophets. Uh, you can read about what's taking place here in the book of Ezra. They go together, okay? And uh, in 536 B.C., a remnant of about 50,000 Jews left Babylon, where they were being held in captivity, to return to Judah, and they did so under the decree of King Cyrus. And uh, King Cyrus was shown in the scriptures where God had called him by name hundreds of years before he was born. That he was going to, God was going to use a king named Cyrus to send his people back to the land. And when he saw that, of course, you can imagine how it must have got a hold of his heart. And so he gave them permission to go back and to take all the vessels of the temple that had been taken by the Babylonians and to take them back to the land of Judah so that they could rebuild God's temple there. And so uh, that's the historical setting. And so they finally got back to the land after that long, hard, dangerous journey. And uh, they quickly rebuilt the altar and began offering sacrifices to God. And uh, two years after their return, they laid the foundation of the temple. And I want you to go back to the book of Ezra. Keep your finger in Haggai. But go back to the book of, of Ezra chapter 3. And uh, when they laid the foundation for the temple, uh, it was a great time of rejoicing and praising God for them. Uh, you think about that hard journey they had made and how God had protected them. And now they're back in the land. They went back with orders to rebuild the temple and the promise of the king to provide for them whatever they needed to, for that building project. And it says in verse 10, And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, they set the priest in their apparel with trumpets and the Levites, the sons, sons of Asaph, with symbols to praise the Lord after the ordinance of David, king of Israel. And they sang together by course in praising and giving thanks unto God because he is good, for his mercy endureth forever toward Israel. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the priests and Levites and chief of the fathers who were ancient men that had seen the first house 
when the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes, wept with a loud voice and many shouted aloud for joy so that the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noise of weeping of the weeping of the people. For the people shouted with a loud shout and the noise was heard afar off. Now, uh, that's one of those cases in the Bible where I hope that there's videotape in heaven. Amen. And, uh, you know, there's, if there is, there's a lot of tape I want God to plug in so we can, you know, watch and listen. And uh, w w after reading that, would, would you agree that that had to be a really special, blessed time for the people of Israel when they laid the foundation of the house? I mean, they're shouting, they're weeping with joy. The old men who had been taken away in captivity uh, probably had to be, you know, in their 80s or 90s by now. And uh, they see the foundation being relayed uh, for this temple. And uh, it's a great time of rejoicing and giving thanks to God. And so two years after the return, they laid the foundation of the temple. Now, when they began to build the house, the Samaritans offered to help the Jews build this house of God. And rightly so, the Jews refused their offer. Well, that got the Samaritans upset, and there was a new king, and so they sent people back to lobby against the rebuilding of the work, and that new king, Darius, ordered the work to stop. Fourteen years go by, and nothing's being done. Fourteen years go by. And in those 14 years, the people got caught up in the routines of life. Do most of us have routines in our life? I mean, isn't typically, I mean, unless you're retired, three months, okay? <laughs> you got to get up. You got to shower. You eat breakfast. Or you go buy Starbucks. And you go to work. And uh, maybe you take your lunch. Maybe you go out for lunch. And uh, you do your work. And you come home and you eat supper and you go to bed. And guess what you get up and do the next day? Go to work. And, you know, you start and you get married and you start having kids and you get caught up in the routines of life and uh, working and raising a family. And maybe, uh, you know, you're building a home. And uh, for 14 years, they did not have a church to go to. And so they got used to life without church. Have you ever seen Christians get out of church and get used to being out of church? You know, I was thinking this week, uh, you know, everybody knows I'm a chaplain. And, uh, you know, if a chaplain shows up on your doorstep with an officer, we're not there to sing happy birthday to you. OK, we're there to turn your world upside down. And uh, I've noticed over the years I've done, been on a lot of death scenes. And uh, I always ask, do you have a pastor or a church or a synagogue that you would, you'd like for me to contact them for you? Guess what the answer is 99% of the time? No. no. And there's two reasons. There's two, two things I see. Number one, <clears throat> there's a whole lot more lost people than there are saved people. Isn't that what Jesus said? Yeah, broad is the gate. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. Many there be that go in there at. Narrow is the way that leads to everlasting life, and few there be that go in thereat. Most of the people that I deal with are not saved. But the other part of that group are people who will say, no, I used to go to church, but I don't go anymore. It's very rare that I find a family of saved people who love the Lord and are active in church. Very, very rare. I would say 1% of the time. And I got thinking about those used to be church members. And what I see that happens to them is this. Life is a lot rougher for them without God than it would be for those who are living with God. Amen. I mean, there, there's something to that. I haven't researched it. That's just a general observation of mine. And so sadly, these people got used to life without church. Over the last 18 months, we've had people who've gotten used to life without church. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Gotten used to it. And sadly, most of them will never come back. That breaks my heart. It ought to break your heart. And, and the reason it ought to break our heart is not our loss that we ought to grieve for. It's the loss that they're going to experience in life. 
God's blessings on their family. Uh, as I talked about this morning, maybe seeing their kids go astray, maybe uh, their grandkids dying and going to hell because they got out of church. There's a heavy price to pay. And so it's at this time that God raised up Haggai to help them to get their priorities right. And write this down tonight, write it in the margin of your Bible. His message, uh, what he preached was very simple. His message was, God will grant you true blessings when you put his house first. God will grant you true blessings when you put his house first. Isn't that what Jesus said in Matthew 6, 33? Remember what he said there? But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall what? Be added unto you. Everything you need in life, uh, God will add those blessings to you if you will put him number one. And so let's look here in Haggai chapter one, and I'm going to read the, the entire chapter. It's only 15 verses, and then uh, we'll get into the message and uh, hopefully get you out in time. You can go over to Dion's and get a slice of pizza tonight, okay? Look in verse number one. In the second year of Darius, the king, in the sixth month, in the first day of the month, came the word of the Lord by Haggai, the prophet, unto Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel. Now, Zerubbabel was a descendant of the last king, okay, uh, before the captivity. Uh, he's a governor of Judah. And the Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Now, this is very unusual. This people say, underline that word, this. Now, if I say the people or I say this people, am I making a distinction there? Yeah, yeah I'm making a distinction. And what God is saying it, 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 to them is this. You know, uh, it, you call yourself my people, but you don't want me to be first in your life. And so I, I see it this way. If somebody really loves the Lord, they always want God to be first. Amen. And so God's making kind of a distinction there. He's not saying my people. He's saying the, this people, this people, these people. This people say the time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. How many years had gone by? 14 years. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet saying, Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses and this house lie waste? Now, that word sealed there is very similar to the word sealing, okay? And uh, I looked that word up, and it means a couple things. Number one, it does mean a sealing. Now, had God's house been finished, was there a roof over God's house? But were these people living in roofed houses? Yeah, and it also talks about uh, 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 using, uh, you know, fine woods to, uh, you know, on the walls of your house, like, you know, mahogany paneling on the wall of your house, very expensive. Have you ever been in a really fancy like mansion and they have this beautiful woodwork on the house? Is that very expensive? Yeah. Does that go up very quickly or does it take a long time to do that? typically takes a long time. You think about it, they had to go cut down the trees. You know, they had to take that to the mill and they had to saw it and they had to sand it and they had to measure it and cut it and install it. So it took a while to do that. And so he says, you're living in your sealed houses and the house of God lies in waste. Now, therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, say it with me, consider your ways. And he says it again in verse number seven. If God tells us something twice, is he pretty serious about it? Yeah. Look again in verse 6. And, and he says, here's the consequence. You have sown much and bring in little. You eat, but you have not enough. You drink, but you're not filled with drink. You clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it into a bag with holes. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, say it with me again, consider your ways. And then he says in verse number 8, Go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the house, God's house, and I will take pleasure in it, and I will be glorified, saith the Lord of hosts. You looked for much, and lo, it came to little, and when you brought it home, I did blow upon it. Why, saith the Lord of hosts, because of mine house that is waste, and you run every man into his own house. Therefore, the heaven over you is stayed from dew, and the earth is stayed from her fruit. 
And I called, I called for a drought upon the land and upon the mountains and upon the corn and upon the new wine and upon the oil and upon that which the ground bringeth forth and upon men and upon cattle and upon all the labor of the hands. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, what's that next word? Amen. Obeyed the voice of the Lord their God. Can you say amen? amen? Isn't it great when people obey God? You know, we sing that song, trust and obey, for there's no other way to what? Be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. They obeyed, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God. And the words of Haggai, the prophet, they actually listened to the preacher as the Lord their God had sent him, and the people did fear before the Lord. Then spake Haggai, the Lord's messenger, and the Lord's message unto the people, saying, I am with you, saith the Lord. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, and the son of Shealtiel, the governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and did work, in the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, in the four and twentieth day of the sixth month in the second year of Darius the king. And uh, I think in about four years they had God's house completed. And so tonight, uh, I want us to look at some things here that I hope will be a uh, help to us. And the title of the message tonight is this, Whose house are you building? Whose house are you building? And uh, sadly, a lot of Christians, they're building their house and they're not concerned about building the house of God. And we're going to see tonight that, uh, that that is not the place of God's blessings. If you want to be in the place of God's blessings, building God's house has to come before building your house. Now, right now, number one tonight, we are all prone to put our house above, above God's house. We're all prone to put our house above above God's house. Now, uh, is, is that an easy thing for Christians to do, to put themselves ahead of God? Have you ever done that? Are you doing that tonight? Remember we talked this morning, we're all born with what? A sin nature. Uh, by nature, are we all self-centered and selfish people? Yeah. yeah. If we uh, put up on the screen tonight uh, a, a camera view of the auditorium, who's the first person that you'd be looking for on the screen? You'd be looking for yourself, wouldn't you? That's just our nature. It's our nature to put our house above God's house. And uh, you see, we have to give some thought uh, to putting God first. If we don't, then naturally we're going to put self first. And uh, tonight, I think every one of us would agree with this, that, that, that it's foolish and vain to live for self in the world. Would you agree with that? Yeah, how often do we do that? We would agree, yep, that's foolish, that's vain to live for self and the world. And uh, I think we'd also agree tonight uh, that, that self and the world can never satisfy us and the things that we need and want in this life. Uh, you know, if God gave you a million dollars tonight, you know what you'd want? Another million, amen? If you had two million, guess what, what you would want? You'd want three million, okay? And so we know that the world uh, can never give us true satisfaction. And uh, I think we'd also agree tonight that true satisfaction in this life can only be found in the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you agree with that? That's where true satisfaction is, is really at. And yet we keep drifting towards the world and uh, unless we fight against that drift. Now, I want to give you four things tonight, four characteristics of those who put their houses above God's house. Four things about those who put their house above God's house. Write these down tonight. Write these down. Number one, those who put their house above God's house are often, listen, committed believers. So what do you mean? Well, think about this. Where, where have these uh, Jews been living at all their life, most of them? Babylon. What was Babylon? Was that some little rinky-dink town? What was it? It was the capital of the world. You think they had all the amenities and luxuries of life there that were available at that time? I mean, they had homes, they had lands, they had farms, they had gardens, they had jobs, they had families. And yet when Cyrus gave them permission to go back, guess what they did? They left it all to go back to Judah. 
What was in Judah at this time? Nothing. What was the city of Jerusalem? It was ruins. Was there any farmland that had been farmed and planted there? No. Who was going to have to break up that ground and plant the seed? They had to do all that. Uh, were there any nice homes waiting for them to move into? No. Who had to build those houses? I mean, they had to go cut the lumber. They had to build those houses. They had to till the fields. They had to, to sow the seed. Uh, you know, there wasn't a church building there. And, and so would you agree that that took a high level of commitment for them to leave Babylon to go back to that? And by the way, did they fly over there? Did they ride a, you know, on an air-conditioned bus? Uh, were they on some train ride? How did they get there? They walked or they went on the back of some animal. And uh, is it warm over there in that part of the world? Yeah. So you think about the sacrifice that they did make. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, when they got there, they did start to rebuild the temple, didn't they? So a lot of times the people that put God's house, uh, put their house above God's house, uh, started off as committed believers. But what happened, they lost their vision and their burden, and they drifted to the place where God's house was no longer a priority. Now, maybe tonight there's some Christians like that here. There was a time when you were very committed to the Lord. You know, we had you give your testimonies for salvation. You know, you got saved. You decided to follow Jesus. You were zealous for the things of God. You never missed church. You got involved in serving in the church. And then the routines of life came along. And, uh, you know, you had a job, you had a position, you had a family to raise, and you got distracted. And pretty soon Jesus and his church were no longer a priority in your life. And it wasn't a deliberate rebellion, but you simply drifted into putting your house ahead of God's house. Now, be honest and ask yourself tonight, is that me? Do I fit that picture? If it does, you need to listen very carefully to all the message. So number one, those who put their house above God's house are often committed believers. Go back to Haggai chapter one and verse number two. The second thing I want you to see is that those who put their house above God's house have reasons for their lifestyle. Well, why is it you are no longer faithful to church? Why is it you're no longer serving? Why is it you dropped out? And, and they will give you a reason why. Look in verse number two. And, and uh, these people had a reason for, for why they had uh, allowed God's house to be forsaken and not built. It says, thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, this people say, the time is not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. What was their excuse? I don't have time. It's not the right time. We're not against it. Oh, we want to see the house of God built, but, but it's just not the right time. The timing's just not right. And, uh, you know, I've got all these other things I'm involved in, and, and, and really, I, I just don't have time for that. Now, I want to tell you tonight, don't we always have time for what's important to us? Yes. Don't we? Yes. Yeah, we all have time to do exactly everything that's important to us. And so, like Billy Sunday said, uh, an excuse is uh, 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 an excuse is the skin of a reason stuffed with a lie, and uh, and so their excuse would be, well, you know, I just have so much going on, and uh, I don't have time, and uh, really, I've got more important things to do, and and when we have time, then we're going to get around to finishing the house of God, and again tonight, we need to ask ourselves if that picture fits us. How many of us are guilty? of excusing our lack of faithfulness and our lack of service on saying, I just don't have time to do that. Now that the time is not right, maybe next year in 2022, uh, maybe, you know, uh, next week sometime. And listen, when we say that we don't have time, what we're really saying, if we're honest, is that God's house and God's work is no longer a priority. Somebody say amen or oh me. It's true, isn't it? It's true. Again, we always have time for what's important for us. 
And so they had reasons, they had excuses. And then the third thing I want you to see about those who put their house above God's house, that is that they're blind to God's chastening hand. They're always blind to God's chastening hand. Look at verse number six, what had happened. Now, remember, they had to go back. Did they have to till the fields? Did they have to plant the seed? Did they have to maybe carry the water in to irrigate it? A lot of hard work, amen? But guess what type of crops they were getting? Very meager. And uh, he says here, you have sown much and bring in little. You eat, but you have not enough. You drink, but you're not filled with drink. You clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it into a bag with holes. Now, what they didn't realize, even though they were working hard, putting that crop in, they were getting a meager harvest. What little amount of money they had, it was being eat up by inflation. Have you all seen the prices going up? And uh, are maybe unexpected expenses. And they're like, why can't we get ahead? We're working hard. You know, and what little money we have, we're trying to be frugal. But there's never enough. It just seems like we got holes in our pockets. It's going away. What they didn't realize that is that God was judging them. They did not see God's chastening hand. Look down in verse number nine. He says, you look for much and lo, it came to little. And when you brought it home, who blew upon it? Who blew it up? God says, I did. I did that. I did blow on it. Why, saith the Lord of hosts, because of mine house that is waste. And you run every man into his what? Own house. Therefore, <clears throat> the heaven over you is stayed from dew. And the earth has stayed from her fruit. And I called for a drought upon the land. And I won't read the rest of that passage. Now, did they see God's chastening hand on them? No. Now, sometimes we wonder, why can't I get ahead? Why is it I have all these bad circumstances in my life? Uh, why is it, you know, I never have enough money? If I do have some money, you know, there's some unexpected expense. Well, it could be because you're guilty of building your house and not God's house. And so if you're spinning your wheels and you're working hard and you're having all kinds of problems, maybe that's the reason why. God's judgment chastising hand is upon you because he's not first in your life. And here's the fourth thing I want you to see about those who put their house above God's house. Look again in verse number six. They never get what they're after. They never get with what they're after. Now, if you look over in, uh, uh, look at verse number four, some of them did dwell in sealed houses. They had really fancy houses. Had all that nice, beautiful paneling on the wall. Okay. Uh, but if you look at verse number six, they didn't really get what they want, did they? They're living in a sealed house. Now think about this. <clears throat> if you don't have enough food to drink, uh, food to eat and water to drink, are you in trouble? Yes. Does it really matter what kind of house you live in? No. no you have a big, beautiful, fancy house. Um, uh, we've been out, you know, knocking doors and uh, go up to doors, ring a doorbell. And a big, beautiful house. I mean, this looks like one of these two-story mansions, you know, and just big and huge. And uh, nobody's home, and they've got a window there by the, by the door. Have you ever looked inside of a house when there's nobody home? And you look inside the house, and guess what? There was no furniture in that house. It was all facade, wasn't it? Now, I'd rather have a smaller house with some furniture in it. Amen? Wouldn't you like to have a couch in your living room? Wouldn't you like to have a bed in your bedroom? Amen? I mean, wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't like to have a refrigerator in your kitchen and a stove? I mean, what good does it do to have this big fancy house if you can't live in it? Isn't that a waste? It's a waste. And so uh, uh, they, they, they weren't really getting what they wanted. And, uh, and, and you read over again in verses 9, 10, 11, read that earlier. 
Even if you get what you want, it never satisfies you. He, he says uh, you're not filled. Uh, uh, you're not satisfied with these things, and you won't be because you're trying to live life without God. Now, how many of you have ever read the book of Ecclesiastes? Right, who wrote the book of Ecclesiastes? Solomon. Solomon, okay. And Solomon had everything that we think you need to have in this life to be happy. Did he have money? Yeah, I mean, that guy had so much money, he was making billions. He was probably the wealthiest man that ever lived. Did he have nice places to live in? Yes, he had beautiful palaces. Uh, did he have all kinds of vineyards and farmlands and, uh, and, 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 and livestock to, to feed on? Did he have everything that he wanted? Yeah. Uh, did he have all kinds of alcohol and wine? Yeah. Did he have all kinds of women? Yeah. A thousand of them. Amen. Remember Brother Seth talked about that? And you know what his conclusion was when he looked at all that? What did he remember what he said? It's all what? Amen. Vanity. Vanity of vanities. It's nothing. It's worse than nothing. I have all this and I'm still not happy. And you look at his life. He begins as a young man. He goes through middle age and he comes to the end of his life. Look in Ecclesiastes chapter number 12. He finally gets it figured out. And uh, I hope it doesn't take uh, us a whole lifetime uh, to figure out what really matters in life. So he had all these things, but he wasn't satisfied. Uh, you've heard me talk about that famous rock and roll song. And uh, some of you from your unsaved days, do you remember a, a rock and roll song by the Rolling Stones called I Can't Get No, Satis I Can't Get no Satisfaction? Remember that song? It's number one rock and roll song of all time. And uh, Keith Richards wrote that in a fancy hotel in Miami, Florida. He woke up. He was surrounded by all the money and wealth and fame uh, that that position brought him, all the drugs, all the women, all the alcohol. And he woke up and said to himself, I can't get no satisfaction. Every time you hear that song, I want you to remember it. He had everything that this world thinks you need to have to be happy. And he says it can't satisfy. Well, look what Solomon's conclusion was. Look in Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and notice in verse number 13. Now, I thank God that Solomon came to the right conclusion. Amen. And this is the wisest man that ever lived. He's smarter than all of us put together. Look what he said. <clears throat> he said, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Read it with me. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. So what was he saying there? Who should be first in our life? God. He said, I said, I spent all those years building my house and it was a waste of time. It didn't make any difference in my life until I started building God's house. And he did, by the way. He did, didn't he? He built the temple. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. And so uh, those who put their house above God's house are never going to be satisfied with it. God won't let it happen. Well, look at the second truth tonight. If we want to <clears throat> build God's house and not our house, we have to continually put God's house above our house. We got to be thinking about that. Can we just, like they did, slip away sometimes? We're not in open rebellion. We just kind of drift away, don't we? And uh, that's why we've got to always be thinking about this. And anything less than putting God first in our life is idolatry. Did you know that? Whatever is ahead of God in your life is an idol. James Boyce put it this way. He said in the final analysis, all inverted priorities are idolatry. They put the creation before the creator. Did you get that? That's what Romans chapter 1 talks about. They put the creator, uh, the creation before the creator. And so how do Christians become guilty of this type of idolatry? Well, there's a couple things. To put God's house above your house requires deliberate and continual effort. It requires deliberate and continual effort. Go back to the book of Haggai. Now, Haggai the preacher was faithful in preaching, thus saith the Lord. He gave them the Lord's word. And I want you to look in verse number 12 what the response was. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, what's that next word? Amen. Obeyed the voice of the Lord their God. 
and the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him, and the people did what? Fear. Fear. Write this down. To put God's house above your house requires deliberate and continual effort, and it begins when we humble ourselves before the Lord. Amen. Somebody say amen. amen. Who did this start with? Look at, look at verse 15. Who did this humbling start with? The people or with their leaders? The leader. Leaders. It started with the leadership. The governor. All right? The high priest. That's where it started. And, and listen, shouldn't our leaders always be leading us to the Lord? Wouldn't that be great if America was that way? Uh, how many leaders do you see in America who are humbling themselves before the Lord? No. And what did God promise? God resists the proud, but he gives grace to who? The humble. One reason America is in the shape it's in tonight is because, listen, the government is trying to take the place of God. They want to be all powerful, don't they? They believe they're omniscient. We know everything. You don't know anything. You listen to us. And they want to be omnipresent. They want to be involved in every area of our life. Uh, have you heard about the government now saying, if you have, if you, uh, have uh, more than a $600 transaction in your bank account, we want the IRS to know about that. And listen, I, I got something to say to the government. It's none of your stinking business where I spend my money. As long as I'm spending it legally, it's none of their, legally, it's none of their business. Amen. But they want to be omniscient, they want to be omnipresent, they want to be omnipotent, all-powerful. They're trying to take the place of God. Uh, they want us to worship them as God. And it's no wonder that our country is in the mess that it's in, and that comes all the way down, all the way down leadership, even in, in cities and churches and in the homes. And so it's got to start with the leaders, and I'm talking to the dads, and I'm talking to the husbands tonight. Uh, if we want to have God's blessings, we have to humble ourselves before him. That means we have to acknowledge that he is number one. And so uh, uh, we have to humble ourselves before him. And then to put God's house above our house requires constant self-evaluation. Look again in verse number five. Look at verse five. Now, there, the, the, now therefore, thus saith the Lord, Lord of hosts. What did he say? Consider, consider your ways. He didn't say consider your neighbor's ways. He said what? Consider your ways. Don't worry about your neighbor. Don't worry about the person next to you or behind you. Consider your ways. And he said the same thing in verse number seven. Consider your ways. That means there has to be constant self-evaluation. Now, let me give you four things that we all need to evaluate in our life. Write these down tonight. Write these in the margin of your Bible. If you don't write them down, you'll walk out and you'll forget them, okay? Number one, how are you spending your time? Is time a valuable resource? Yes. And wherever you spend your time, that's what's important to you, okay? How are you spending your time? Now, you look at these people here. They had plenty of time for themselves, didn't they? But did they have any time for the Lord's house? No. Consider your ways. Where are you spending your time? Then number two, how are you spending your money? How are you spending that money that God gave to you? If you want to know what a person's priorities are, you used to be able to say, well, take a look at their checkbook. But how many of us have a checkbook anymore? I, I, yeah, a few of you do. The old, old ones, okay. None of the young ones, all gray heads, okay. Uh, but, but now young people, they get that monthly credit card statement. Look and see where your money is going. Consider your, consider your ways. And then number three, the third thing to consider is, what are your goals? What is your life aimed at? Everybody's life is aimed at something. Uh, is it aimed at advancing your kingdom or is it aimed at advancing God's kingdom? And then number four, here's the fourth thing. What do you think about the most? What do you think about the most? Uh, uh, what, what do you want the most? Do you want what you want or do you want what God wants? What do you spend your time thinking about? And, uh, and so if we consider our ways and in the fear of the Lord, we put God's house above our house, uh, what are the results that come for us? Well, look at verse number eight. Look at verse number eight. God tells us. He says, go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the house. He says, go up there and cut down that mahogany. 
go up there and cut down that oak and uh, begin to build my house. And look what he says. And I will take what? Pleasure in it. And I will be what? Glorified. When you put God's house above your house, God is pleased and God is glorified. God is pleased and God is glorified. Jesus said, I do always those things that please my father. Wouldn't that be great if we could have that same testimony? Shouldn't that always be our desire? I want to please God above everybody else in all things. God is pleased and God is glorified. You remember that saying, if mama ain't happy, nobody's happy. Amen. Listen, that applies to our spiritual life. If God ain't happy with your life, guess what he's going to make your life? He's going to make it miserable. He's going to make it miserable. You're going to have holes in your pocket. You're not going to get ahead. You're going to be frustrated. You're not going to be satisfied. Maybe working harder than ever and still can't get ahead. So God is pleased and glorified. Look at verse 14. Here's the second thing that happens. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the governor of Judah, and the spirit, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And here's just a, a pause right here. Here's just a side note. That is what you call revival. The people got revived. The people got revived. If you want to get revived, you've got to put God's house ahead of your house. And it says, uh, and, and they came and did work in the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. So God is pleased and glorified. And the second thing that happens, his work gets done. Now, let's be honest tonight. Do we need workers for ministry here at Mesa Baptist? Amen. How many years have you heard me begging and pleading for workers? The whole time. Yeah. We're always, listen, we can't get people to work in the bus ministry. Our bus ministry is dying. It's not because there's not enough kids out there. There's more kids than ever. And like I already said, most of them are lost. Amen. They come out of lost families. Shouldn't somebody try to win those kids to Christ? Or should we just sit back and complain when we read about these juvenile delinquents? Wouldn't it be better to invest in getting the gospel to them? You know why we don't have bus workers? Because they're too busy building their house instead of building God's house. We're always begging for, for Sunday school teachers. Can't get enough Sunday school teachers. You know why? Too many are more concerned about building their house than building God's house. We can't get people in the choir. That choir ought to be packed. You know why it's not? Too many people are concerned about building their house instead of God's house. Somebody say amen or oh me. Yeah. It's really simple. When God's work gets done, it's because people are putting God first in their life. And when it's not getting done, it's because they're putting themselves first. And then look at verse number 13. Then spake Haggai, the Lord's messenger and the Lord's message unto the people saying, read it with me. I am with you. I am with you. God was pleased and glorified. His work was getting done. And he said, I'm with you. Now, I got news for you tonight, folks. How many of you would like to live life without God? Is that the place of blessing? Is that the place of peace? Is that the place of joy? Satisfaction? No. When you have God with you, your life is truly blessed. Amen. Amen. You know, I've met some Christians didn't have much materially, but boy, they were multi-billionaires spiritually. I think about Audrey Swords. How many folks remember Audrey Swords? She lived on maybe $700 a month, Social Security. And uh, she was over here at this assisted living place by the Senior Citizen Center. <clears throat> and to save on expenses, she would open her door in her apartment so the air conditioning in the hallway could come in and air condition her apartment. In the wintertime, she left the door open so the heat in the hallway would come in and heat her room. And she didn't have much materially, but if you, miss, if you knew Miss Audrey, was she very wealthy spiritually? Yes. Did God bless her? Yes. Yeah. Was God first in her life? Yes. Oh, yeah. 
That was never a doubt, was it? I mean, we never had to worry about her. I remember her uh, calling me sometimes uh, uh, when her Social Security check would come in late and she'd be crying, Preacher, uh, I just got my Social Security check and I won't be able to get my tithe and off missions offering in the offering plate this Sunday. And uh, boy, is God going to be upset with me? And I said, no, Miss Audrey, God understands. Amen. It's not a question of your heart. I mean, I, we, he knows and I know if you had, you'd put it in. And guess what? When she got it, guess what she did? She put it in. Amen. And even though she didn't have much materially, she had wealth that most of us uh, uh, don't get to enjoy. And so uh, God says, I'm going to be with you. And that's very important because without God, there are no blessings. Think about it. Every good gift cometh down from where? From above, from the Father of lights. Don't you want God's blessings on your life? Don't you want God's blessings? Sure you do. But make sure you're building his house and not just your house. Well, let's bow our heads in prayer tonight. Every head bowed, every eye closed in prayer. And, um, you know, the Bible tells us that we're going to see a great falling away in the last days. And we are. We've seen it last year and a half. We've seen it. I mean, God is, uh, you know, separating the wheat from the chaff. Uh, God is separating the, you know, the committed from the uncommitted. We're seeing it take place. And, and uh, even though we may not like what we're seeing, uh, we ought to give God thanks for the fact that that just means we're getting closer to Jesus coming. Amen. And uh, above all else, we want to be found faithful when we stand before the Lord. And, uh, you know, I think about these Jews. They were living in hard times, too. And they heard the word of God from Haggai, the, the prophet, uh, put God's house first and he will bless you for it. And they did. And he did. And God's promise to them stands true for you and I tonight. If we will put God first in our life and focus on building his house and his kingdom instead of ours, then God's blessings will surely come to us. Our Father in heaven, uh, we thank you tonight, Lord, for this message from your word. Uh, Lord, I needed this, Lord, and sometimes we can just uh, slowly, undeliberately drift away from you and uh, get our focus uh, on the wrong things and get our mind in the wrong place and uh, invest our time in the wrong things in the wrong places, Father. And uh, Lord, I pray tonight that you would speak to every heart. And uh, Father, we saw that when they responded and obeyed uh, your word and did put you first, that their spirit was stirred up. Lord, there was a, a spirit of revival that came over the people and uh, they pitched in and, and, and they got the house of God built. And uh, you blessed them for that. And you closed up the holes in their pockets. And uh, Lord, you uh, brought harvest to the fields. And uh, Lord, the place of blessing is always in the center of your will and in putting you first in our life. And Father, tonight, I pray that we would respond to the message. Lord, uh, maybe we need to come to the altar and get on our knees and say, oh, God, forgive me. Uh, I didn't mean to, but I got away from you. And, and I've been focused on building my house and my kingdom instead of your house and your kingdom. God, forgive me. And uh, Lord, revive my heart and help me to put you first so that I can have your blessings upon me and so that God's work can be done here at Mesa Baptist Church. Bless now this invitation time, I pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand together tonight, sing the invitation hymn. May God speak to your heart tonight. You know, we're to be doers and not just hearers of God's word. And it's always good to respond. Come down here to the altar, get on our face before God and cry out for his help. And God will set us on the right path. And so if God's speaking to you tonight, you step out and come as we sing. I gave my life for thee, my precious blood I shed. Will you come? That thou God might speaking. ransom be and quicken from the dead. I gave, I gave my he gave life us all for, for thee. Us. What hast thou given for me? I gave, I gave my life for thee. What hast thou done for me? My Father's house of light, my glory circled throne. I left for earthly night, for wandering sad and lone. I left, I left it all 
for thee hast thou left aught for me. I left, I left it all for thee hast thou left aught for me. I suffered much for thee, more than thy tongue can tell, of bitterest agony to rescue thee from hell. I've borne, I've borne it all for thee, what hast thou borne for me? I've borne, I've borne it all for thee, what hast thou borne Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. We're just going to sing another verse or two here in a moment, but with their heads bowed and their eyes closed as the musicians play quietly. Uh, would you just ask the Lord right now, Lord, you know my heart. Search me, O oh God. Search me. Where is my focus at, Lord? Is it on me or is it on you? Is it on your kingdom or my kingdom? My house or your house? We're really not the ones to make that evaluation. We need to ask the Lord to make it for us. If you're saved, though, the Holy Spirit of God lives within you. If you'll ask honestly, he'll answer honestly. And if the answer is, you're focused on your house. That's not the place you want to be. You'll never get ahead. You'll never be satisfied. What you want to hear him say is, yes, you are focused on me and my kingdom. God bless you. God bless you for that. So we're going to sing another verse. And if God said your focus is in the wrong, wrong spot, why don't you respond right now? Let's sing, Brother Kenny. And I have brought to thee down from my home above Salvation full and free, my pardon and my love I bring, I bring rich gifts to thee what hast thou brought to me? I bring, I bring rich gifts to thee. What hast thou brought to me? Amen. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Man, I'm selfish. I want God's blessings on Jeff Carr. Amen. How many of you want God's blessings on you? Amen. Well, uh, God tells us how to get it. God tells us how to get it. And uh, if you've been beating your head against the wall, spinning your wheels, working harder than ever, can't get ahead, maybe that's the reason why. Maybe this is the reason why exactly what we saw here tonight. Well, let's bow our heads in prayer. I want to thank you for coming tonight. Thank you for being so attentive and faithful. And uh, trust we'll see you back Wednesday night at 7. Uh, we had a great concert Wednesday night with the Patch Club. That was awesome. I'd like to get them back again sometime. They won't be here this Wednesday night, but Brother Kenny and I will be here. Amen. And uh, so uh, we'll do some preaching and we'll get on our knees and pray. We got Patch Club. Uh, we got the teen class going on. So plan to come and encourage others to come with you. Let's bow our heads in prayer tonight and uh, thank God for the good days given to us. Brother Ted Nadasky, would you pray for us, please? Father, it has been so good to be in the house of God.